I'm Jay Kingley, co-founder and CEO of Maven, your host of Fractionals Unplugged. I'm joined today by Zach Selch, a fractional chief sales officer who's been in sales for over 35 years, the last two years in a fractional capacity. Zach focuses on working with manufacturing companies that are trying to expand into new markets. Zach is based in Evanston, Illinois. Welcome, Zach. Thanks for having me, Jay. This looks like a lot of fun. Welcome to Fractionals Unplugged, an insider's perspective vodcast and podcast from Maven. You've left the corporate executive world to build your own business to secure your income, savor your independence, and succeed on your terms. But you have to get past the struggles of acquiring clients, building a pipeline, and getting paid what you're worth. In this podcast, Jay Kingley, the CEO of Maven, and his guests share their best practices, tips, and tricks on how you can get out of Struggle City and into Success City and beyond. Enjoy today's episode. All right, Zach, I'm the CEO of a hundred million pound manufacturing company based in London, England. I'm looking to rapidly expand the sales of my groundbreaking product into Asia, North and South America, and the South Pacific. We bump into each other for the first time at a trade show. You've got a maximum of 60 seconds to give me your elevator pitch. Go. Well, Jay, most people who are expanding and selling internationally well, typically will tell me they have, you know, 40, 45 distributors and about 80% of those are weak and about 20% of those are really doing the job. And what would happen if we could invert that? What if 80% of your distributors around the world and all the best target markets were as good as your best distributors today and all the weak ones were in the process of being replaced? How would that impact your goals? And that's basically what I do, Jay, is I get you engaged, competent distributors in all the target markets. So, Zach, who would you say is your ideal client and how would you describe the target market that you focus on? Part, my ideal client is somebody who has been very successful in selling in the market they're comfortable with. doesn't really matter what they're selling. I've dealt with pretty much any type of service or product you can think of. They've done really well and now they're tasked with global expansion. They're going into multiple markets that are unusual to them, that are culturally different, have different experiences. And here's the important thing. They recognize they really want to succeed and they're willing to ask for help. That's my ideal client. Some of these people have 20 years experience. Some of them have eight years experience. But that's typically my ideal client. For these people who who have been very successful and want to be successful in international expansion, and they're willing to ask for help. And what size companies do you normally work? I've done a project for a Fortune 50 company, and I've worked with a lot of startups. I've been part of, I've been on the team of 11 startups. I've helped a whole bunch of other startups, including even Series A. So it really stretches a whole gambit of different sizes. What I really like are these hundred million dollar manufacturers that are doing very well in their domestic market. But pretty much if you want to expand and you're willing to ask for some help, that's the type of thing that I'm, I'm looking for. So why do your clients need what it is that you do? I would say international growth, international sales is probably the one area in a company that is worst served possibly. Because if you think about it, you go into a company and where does the chief financial officer come from? Well, you have a very clear path for that. Where typically does a manufacturing manager come from? The, the R&D manager. And then with sales, it's almost always somebody who maybe they have a business degree, but, but typically they got into sales They've been good at it. It's hard to explain why, because there are different types of people who have been pretty good at sales. They mm -hmm. move their way up. Now, when it comes time to international sales, 
very often you say, well, how do I know who's going to be good at international sales? I, I grab a sales guy and his wife is uh, Vietnamese. So you go, okay, I'm going to make you head of international, right? That happens all the time. And very often these people do it for two years. They don't really like it because it's such hard work. And then they jump boat to get a better job. They go on to be the global head of sales and they go back to focusing on domestic and doing a little bit of international. So there isn't even an, a, an institutional knowledge that's been, been held on to. So what you typically have is this is one of the most important jobs in the company. There's very little stored institutional knowledge. The person who's doing it doesn't really have to how he got there. And so people struggle with it. And then what you find is, can you afford somebody like me full time? Probably not. But am I going to be better than getting some guy right out of college who has no experience for the same amount of money? Definitely, I will be. So that's typically where 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 it hits is these companies that have struggled. Almost every company I've worked for has tried to solve this problem a half dozen times before they find me. You know, I think that the affordability obviously is an issue. And if a client can't afford you, they can't afford you. But I think on the other side, it's not whether they need someone full time or whether they can use a fractional per se. It's what is it that we want to achieve and what's it going to take to achieve our objectives, which brings me to my uh, next question for you is having talked about, if you will, the pain points that your target market experiences. Tell me what outcomes these folks could expect when they work with you. In other words, when all that pain goes away, what, what do they get? What's their return? Well, again, typically the companies I'm working for, let's say if you're under $500 million, you're going to be selling through a distribution organization where you, you really can't afford to be selling direct. So you need good distributors. And, you know, the first problem I hear everybody say is, well, you you can't find good distributors. And I'll talk to people all the time and I'll say, well, in my field, there just aren't good distributors. Or they'll say, we have distributors, but they're really lazy and they're not very good. And and I'll say this to people all the time. They'll say, well, the distributors we have, the, the distributors in place we have aren't very good. And I'll say, what kind of car does your distributor drive? And uh, and either they'll say, I don't know. And I'll say, well, if you've never been in your distributor's car, that's your problem, not his problem. But they'll say, well, he's driving this really nice Porsche sedan. I'll say, okay, so your distributor in Singapore, where you have to pay 100K a year to park, is driving a quarter of a million dollar car. And you're telling me he's no good at sales. Your distributor is probably pretty damn good at sales. He just isn't selling your product. So let's not think of him as being no good. Let's think of him as being no good for you today. And how do we get him there? So so first of all, there's, do you have distributors? And then are these distributors engaged? Do they want to sell your product? Um, are they competent? Are they accountable? And very often, most companies, what they'll do is they'll go out and they'll they'll go they'll stand at a trade show, and some guy will come up and say, "I want to be your distributor in Singapore," and they'll sign him without doing any type of checks on if he can do it, and they won't ask him to do anything. They'll say, "Well, you know, what we want from you in the first year is a hundred thousand dollar purchase order." Cool, but they're not saying we want these activities or we want to check or we want to train your people or anything like that. So you go through this and you just go through a cycle of bad distributors who aren't performing. So back to your question, what you get when you work with me, I've I've onboarded about a thousand distributors in 135 countries around the world in all sorts of different areas. I, I honestly believe that there is nobody out there who can say that. And, and what you get from me is basically I put together a distribution organization for you. I'll do it faster than anybody else. And every one of those distributors will be engaged, competent, and accountable with the proper level of bandwidth to sell your product in that market. 
And then what you're going to get from me is a standard operating system to run your distributors, a playbook to work with your distributors so they're comfortable with you. All these tools that you probably don't know how to build and you might not even know you need them. And when we part company, you're going to have a system and pl- you're going to have distributors and a system in place to run them that will keep you growing for years after we part company. And that's essentially what I bring to the table. Uh, for my clients. So why do you think manufacturing companies that are looking to sell internationally or in your target market, why are they struggling to get rid of the pain points you talked about to get the outcomes they want? You know, why are they struggling to do that on their own? Why do they need your help? Again, usually they just don't have this knowledge in house. And if you think about it, very often uh, companies in the United States, it's very common. Like, again, let's talk about this $100 million manufacturing company. You keep eight or 10 salespeople in the US market, you're selling direct. You want to expand internationally, you say, okay, we're going to put in charge uh, uh, an international sales manager, and he's going to sell through channels. So who do you take? You grab one of your direct sales guys who's done pretty good in Ohio, and you make him your head of international sales. And you say, now you're selling through channels internationally. So he has to figure this out. And very often, you know, I talk to people who have been doing direct sales for manufacturers for years, and they say, oh, yeah, channel sales, that's like marketing. You know, you, you basically, you wait for people to send you in purchase orders. They, they don't understand the whole concept behind it, how, how to get the right partners in place, how to manage them, all that. So that knowledge is, is just really not there. There aren't business schools that teach it. If you take a look at the books on Amazon I'm selling, uh, there are probably 500 to one direct sales books to channel sales books. The book that I wrote, the books that I've written, I think they are the only international channel sales books out there that focus on international channel sales, right? So the knowledge just isn't out there. Even though, no matter how much you want to know this, there's no place for you to go and get help. And that's, that's one of the problems that people have and why they're struggling. So if you think about your target market as they look at expanding internationally through third-party distributors, I think it's easy to say this is an important issue for them. But you and I both know that while being important is necessary, it won't motivate them to action. To motivate somebody to action, they have to feel an urgency. Mm -hmm. So what do you see that makes this an urgent issue for these types of clients? I'll tell you what, there, there are three things that do this. One is an investor says, an investor or board member says, you know, another company I'm investing in is selling much more internationally than you are. How come? And they they push. Um, Sometimes internally, the CEO or the owner or the founder will say, well, I want to sell the company and somebody told me that if I add international sales, the value of the company will go up dramatically. And then sometimes, and this is my favorite, is the person tasked with international sales will get in the job and they'll go, okay, I represent 10% of the company's sales and I have no way of getting to be more than that. So I'm going to spend the rest of my career here sitting at the children's table and everybody's going to treat me with disrespect because I only have 10% of the overall sales. What can I do to grow that? And then they, they decide that they really want to grow because they were, you know, the top salesperson for the mid, Midwest or they were the top salesperson for the Southeast. And now they're in a job that they feel like they're, they're not at the top anymore and they they want to get there they want help getting there and and that's typically my favorite kind of client they know they want to grow they know they want help and they're looking for somebody who can help them get there the dreaded children's table once you're 10 12 years old that's the last place you want to be let alone as an adult so you talked about the Yeah, you talked about the struggles that companies have of 
setting up effective third party distribution in international markets and, and how they often just spin around in circles. So what's your insight into the root cause that's responsible for this that you find your clients just don't understand? I'll tell you what, think about the semantics of this. And the semantics in this particular case, I find to be really important. So very often you'll talk to somebody and he'll talk about his distributors as his customers, right? And it makes sense because why does he say that? He says, well, they're giving me a check. They're paying me. They're my customer. And when you think about your customer, you say, well, if he's my customer, I can't ask my customer what he does with the stuff I sell him. I can't tell him how much he has to buy. I can't tell him how to run his business. He's my customer. And the same type of thing, very often, I'll ask people, I'll say, well, does your international sales manager, does he support the distributors or does he manage the distributors? And nine times out of 10, they'll say, oh, his job is to support the distributors. And, and what are they thinking? They're thinking, well, the distributor puts in an order. I ship him a widget. And then I call up the, the regional sales manager and I say, can you come out and do a demo for me? Because I have to do a demo for my, my customer. So now what we know is this distributor doesn't know how to do a demo. He's asking somebody else to do it, which means not, I sold him a box. Now I'm shooting my, uh, my regional sales manager halfway around the world to do a demo for him so he can sell the box. Now, just change that language. Say, I'm managing part of my sales organization. The distributors are my external sales organization. I can ask them for resumes of all their salespeople. I can tell them what type of training their salespeople need. I can ask them about every project in their funnel. And I can say, okay, look, your conversion rate between demos and, and, and asking for a proposal is low. Obviously, your demo is pretty weak. Let's work on that. It's a totally different thing. Now, they're, they're just like my employee. I just don't pay them. I give them margin on the sale of a product. And switching that is huge. <laughs> That little change can be a thousand percent growth over a three year period because that's the difference between saying, Oh, the guy's doing me a favor. He bought a box from me and one day he might sell it or saying, Look, you want to be my partner, my distributor in this territory. You need to be doing 200 sales calls a year. And I'm going to tell you the script to use to do those calls. What's going to get you better results in that territory? So, Zach, what experiences did you have in your career that enabled you to develop these insights that you have and that, frankly, most of your direct competitors don't have? So a lot of it was just sticking with it because I started out like everybody else. I, I, I sort of jumped into this. Nobody taught me anything. Nobody mentored me. I, I was reading books that weren't meant. For channel sales. And I was sort of trying to figure out how to take something and make it work for me. And, and I sucked at the beginning, like everybody else. I was trying to figure this out. And over the years, I'd pick up a trick here or a trick there. And, you know, basically what I realized was if you start looking at the partners as the channel channel partners and distributors like they're part of your sales organization. And I can't even tell you how I came up with this, but I sort of woke up one day and I, and that's what I was doing. And you, you manage them and you push them for information and you make them do things your way and all of this, um, you're going to get much, much better results. And if you are demanding of the partners, that they give you information and they do things a certain way, you have to give them a lot more not and not necessarily margin. You have to support them. You have to train them. You have to hold their hands. You know, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, there are literally dozens of salespeople who have worked for distributors for me over the years who thanked me for mentoring them, who thanked me for training them, those type of things. 
Um, I, I, I've had jobs where I had probably 200 salespeople working for my distribution organization, and I knew all of them. I knew their wives. I knew them. I knew what, what made them tick, and that's part of the commitment. So over the years, I've picked this up, and I'll tell you one very specific thing that I remember from years ago, which I didn't appreciate at the time. I had a, a CEO who I thought was well, it's not that I thought he was an idiot. He was an idiot. But he had a real friendliness and relationship with the distributors that were in place when I came on board in the company. So, you know, they, they had not grown. They hired me to grow. We were able to grow literally uh, about 2,000% over a period of a few years. There was a huge amount of room to grow, but there were these eight distributors that were old friends of his. He played golf with them. He had known them for years. And he said, Zach, please don't terminate these distributors. So I, I, I was able to terminate one of them because he really wasn't a good fit. But the other seven, I was able to turn around and I was able to get them to grow about 300% on average over a couple of year period. Now, by limiting my tools, my first reaction was I wanted to terminate all of them. But because I didn't terminate them, I had to focus on different uh, activities to get really underperforming distributors to perform better. And, and that was really helpful for me. That was about 20 years ago. And I, I, it was very, very helpful for me. Um, you know, I can't fire everybody. So when, when I'm working with people very often, the first thing I do is try and figure out how I can get better performance out of the existing distributors without having to terminate them. And again, I'll tell you what, if you ask nine out of 10 people in my job, people who deal with international channel sales, they'll tell you there's no way to get better performance out of an underperforming distributor. Uh, and I used to believe that too, 20 years ago. So th these are some of the things I've learned over the years. Well, I really resonate with this idea that uh, anytime you start something new, you're going to suck. If you mm -hmm. want to get great, it's about repetition and learning from each rep. And I think, right. Zach, that is a key element of your story. All right, we are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to learn a bit about Zach. You've spent the last 25 or more years working your way up the corporate ladder, achieving success and reward along the way. Whether corporate kicked you to the curb or you walked out the door of your own volition, there is no going back. You're nowhere close to retiring, so you're moving on to your second act as a fractional executive. You're feeling the thrill of freedom mixed with the dread of the unknown. You're not alone. Maven works with the elite 20%, turning the top fractional executive's aspirations into reality easily and quickly. Imagine the right clients needing your genius, chasing you to get it, and happy to pay you for the impact you make. Maven helps you build all aspects of your business to fund your lifestyle without having to work corporate hours. With Maven, market yourself easily, select your clients with purpose, and build a business that leverages your genius on your terms, not on someone else's. Reach out to Jay at j.kingley at referabilitymaven.com. Transform your expertise into a prosperous business where you'll make the impact you want with all the freedom, flexibility, and control that you've earned. Welcome back. We're talking to Zach Selch, a fractional sales executive, serving manufacturing companies, seeking to rapidly expand into new markets. Zach, let's find out a bit more about you. And let me start with what happened in your life, personally or professionally, that most explains why you're doing what you do today. So I'll, I'll tell you a little story. I, uh, I grew up pretty poor. Now, not like the, your parents buy you a used car when you're 16 poor. I mean, I was like really, really poor. And when I was uh, 11, I was living in a, in a trailer on blocks parked behind a gas station in rural Pennsylvania. And, um, and right down the street, was a flea market. And, you know, here I am in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, pretty much living in, in a situation where, like, I, I, I typically never had new clothing. You know, I'd have 
you hand-me-downs and we were food insecure. I mean, real poverty. And I got in my head that I wanted to travel. And I had never seen anything. I had never been anywhere. Uh, but I wanted to travel. I would watch, you know, TV shows about travel and all of this. And um, one day I walked out of the flea market and I got myself a job selling um, factory second cutting boards. So here I am, I'm 11 years old in a flea market in rural Pennsylvania, and I am like on fire in terms of sales. In 1976, there were days when I was bringing home $100 in commission. You can imagine, you know, it was almost my family's monthly rent. I could bring home in a day's commission selling cutting boards. And I'm 11 years old, and I thought, you know what? I If I can sell something, I can sell anything. And I bet I can sell internationally. And that is my ticket to getting the hell out of here and traveling and seeing the world. So that was just sort of like a, a, a thing that stuck in my head. And basically, that's what I worked towards doing. I figured if I can get a first job selling internationally, I can leverage that. And that's it. My first sales job was an international sales job in Africa. And then I moved that into a job in, in Europe. And basically, I've been uh, selling internationally ever since. And I do enjoy the travel. I do enjoy the different cultures. I do enjoy that mix up. But that's really what drove me into doing what I did. And I spent uh, about 25 years of my life as an expatriate living all over the world. And then I moved back home to give my kids the uh, a more stable life, which is what my wife wants. Having also grown up in rural Pennsylvania, I know exactly <laughs> the type of area and environment that you are talking about. What advice would you give other fractional executives who are trying to build their business? In terms of uh, advice to fractional executives, I'm going to say cash flow is king. Um, whatever else you're thinking, you will struggle with cash flow before you think you're doing well. And, and typically, you know, what happens is, and, and, and tying that up is also pipeline. Pipeline solves everything. So what very often happens, it happened to me and it happens to a lot of people. You know, I, I was thinking about this. I got a couple of gigs. I quit my job and I started working fractionally. And between my expenses and so on, the two gigs weren't quite enough. But then I didn't pick up another gig for a while. And then before I picked up another gig, I lost one of my gigs because it timed out because it was, you know, and, and I wasn't thinking about prospecting, et cetera. Okay. So you say, what's my biggest advice? Think really, really carefully about how you're going to spend your money. Keep your nut down as small as possible in the beginning. Work. Don't, don't go a day without doing some prospecting. Make sure you always have a pipeline. If you can keep your nut down and your pipeline flowing, you're going to do really well at this, but otherwise you're going to really struggle. That's, that's my biggest advice. So Zach, what's for you over the next 12 months? I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. I think I've gotten to the point where my prospecting system is working really well for me. I I'm, I'm looking at building a collective as a, as another side gig sort of where you know it, there are a lot of people who can't afford me but if i could build a collective and charge them you know, 35 dollars or 75 dollars a month to get information from me be part of a group talk to other people about international sales i think there's probably a pretty good market there so I think that's probably the next big project I'm going to work on is building up an international sales uh, leader collective. So, Zach, I'm sure we've got some people in our audience that would love to connect with you. What is the best way for somebody to contact you? I am 
constantly on LinkedIn, Zach Selch. I'm the only guy there. Um, but I also have a website called globalsalesmentor.com. So if you search either Global Sales Mentor or you search for Zach Selch, uh, you'll find me. It's uh, There aren't that many people with my name. Uh, it, it's not that difficult to find me. Well, we'll make it even easier. We will put Zach's contact information in our show notes for both the podcast and our video. Zach, I want to thank you for being a guest on our Fractionals Unplugged show. Be sure to subscribe to both our podcast on all the major platforms and on our YouTube channel for our videos. Until next time, make an impact on your clients and family on your terms, securing your independence with the freedom, flexibility, and control that you've earned.